Hello. It has been five long years since I last stood on this stage and actually had the opportunity to address this community. Um, and I don't think I've ever empathized with someone quite as much as when CCP Berger was on the stage yesterday saying that being on this stage is kind of his happy place, because, his safe place, because just being here with the community honestly is um, comforting in a way that's hard to describe. Uh, so as, as I said, well, my name is Andrew Groen. Uh, I write a book series called Empires of Eve. I've been writing about Eve Online. Yes, yes, let's do a round of applause for Empires of Eve. Yeah, thank you. Hey, we got a coffee in the audience. Appreciate that. Um, so the first time that I ever came to FanFest was actually 10 years ago. And the slogan for EVE Online at the time was EVE Online into the second decade. And now I feel like that's actually my mission right now, is heading into the second decade. The grains keep slipping through the hourglass, my friends. It's terrifying. So I wanted to use this as an opportunity to kind of give you guys an update on where Empires of EVE is right now before we get into the rest of the presentation. Um, to use this as an opportunity to, to show you, or to tell you who I am, first of all, if you don't actually know who I am, um, and to see what I've actually been up to in the two years since Empires of Eve Volume 2 came out. So in 2013, I was a journalist at Wired when I decided to launch a Kickstarter to raise uh, a, a simple amount of money to, to print 1,000 copies of a book about Eve Online that I was writing at the time, um, and this community sight unseen and really without my having to ask for too much, um, decided to just overflow the funding for the project and allowed me to, to create the book that I always wanted to but never even really bothered to dream I would be able to have the space and the funding to be able to go um, and report and to interview everybody in the community and to, to find the story that I always wanted to write. And the experience of that fundamentally changed my life, and I'm, I'm, I'm still to this day, I mean, I'm here because of that initial trust that the community placed in me, and um, yeah, I just can't, I, to, to this day, I still feel warm fuzzies in, in my belly uh, over that moment because it was one of the defining moments of my life. And then in 2018, we did a campaign uh, on Kickstarter for a sequel, which attracted even more support, and now, to date, Empires of Eve has actually sold nearly 30,000 copies worldwide. And uh, just being, even saying that is, is absurd to me because, like I said, the whole mission in the first place was just to print a thousand copies of the book. And I thought most of those were going to end up in my closet. So I, I, to, be able, to be here at this moment is, um, is incredible. And I thank you all so much. So uh, last month, I actually got a really incredible email, kind of out of the blue, from a museum in Spain called the Espacio Telefonica, and they're creating a museum exhibit on virtual worlds, and they wanted to include Empires of Eve in their museum exhibit. This is a, a screenshot or a, a, a picture. <laughs> they're called pictures when they're real. Um, <laughs> of an exhibit that they did previously on uh, digital misinformation. It's a really wonderful place. Um, and they do a lot of amazing things with technology and popular culture. And so the, museum, uh, the exhibit is called Virtual Worlds from Cyclorama to Metaverse. Uh, and it's going to be running from November 22nd, 2023 through April 2020, or 2024. So if you find yourself in Madrid for whatever reason, it's free to the public. So you can go in and check out an EVE Online exhibit and uh, see what we've been working on. Just as a, a quick aside, for anybody who doesn't know what a cyclorama is, it's actually kind of interesting. It's an 18th century technology that's kind of, in a vague way, the first ever virtual world. What they would do is they had these traveling uh, carnivals, basically, as a carnival exhibit, where they would take a huge panoramic 360 degree image that they would paint of like, Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo or whatever, and they would pipe in music and there would be a door and you would walk into the center of it and you'd be surrounded by like uh, a battle that was unfolding and this was like the 18th century uh, version of a virtual world, which is uh, really cool actually. <laughs> I would love to go, I wish we still had those. 
So right now, the Empires of You Volume 2 audiobook is something that I just finished working on. Um, and it's currently only available to backers of the Kickstarter for Volume 2, but that is going to change very shortly because I just finally did all of the little annoying things that you have to do in order to submit it to Audible. It's a very annoying little process. Uh, but I submitted that five or six days ago, and I'm told it takes about 10 days to, to get through the approval process. So with a little bit of luck, it should be available for purchase uh, as soon as next week, ideally. Oh, we get, we get a round of applause for that? Thank you, guys. That's really cool. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. So for the future of the, of the series, I want to talk about that a little bit before we get going. Um, in uh, next year, in 2024, I'm going to be beginning work on some sort of new installment in this series. It is very hard for me to talk about what I'm going to be doing next year because I work by myself. I'm a single person company, so when things get delayed or things slow down, my entire company comes to a screeching halt. So it's very difficult to call my shot a year out, um, but I am very, I have ideas in my head for what I want to do in the future, and I'm exploring those, and, I, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I do not think it's going to be a full-on Empires of You Volume 3, simply because I just don't think that's the best idea for how to explore the rest of the story. But I do think that whatever we end up doing will end up substantially expanding the narrative beyond the events of Volume 2. Um, and whatever I do, I promise it'll be a great idea. So. Uh, moving on to what we're actually going to talk about today. And I wanted to open this up by talking about Empires of Eve because this was the headspace that I was in when I started working on the, the next project that, I was, that I've been working on for the last five years. And it all started when I was in the, the finishing stages of that book. And I want to show you guys something that will be very familiar to a lot of you, um, but we're making a grander point here. So, um, this is, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, this is the sovereignty map of EVE Online that shows which organizations own which NullSec territories. And this is a screenshot of EVE as it appeared in 2007. And it's amazing because we can actually, this is a time lapse, and you can watch a screenshot is each frame of this video showing a day in the life of EVE Online. And so what I want you to do is I want you to keep your eye on the bottom left-hand corner here. A lot of you are going to know what's coming, but it's, it's still pretty interesting to watch it happen. In, you know, maybe 20 or 30 seconds, this blue blob down here in the bottom left-hand corner that says Band of Brothers on it, something terrible is going to happen to it. And uh, we talked about this earlier in the keynote that this is the dissolution of Band of Brothers and what's going to Oh, it's already gone. Oh, my God, he's gone. Band of Brothers, Bob is dead. I can't believe it happened. Um, and I, I, these, watching this video was so important to me to understanding what EVE Online actually is because when you see moments like that happen on the map, you know instinctively as a storyteller that's where the story is. Those moments of, of drastic seismic change are where you go to find the human dramas that makes the story of Eve actually worth learning to people. Those are the moments where everything changed. That's what you need to understand in order to understand the ebb and flow of power. So you see, for a, a long period of time, the map usually tends to remain mostly stable until you get to these moments where suddenly everything shifts and all of a sudden uh, a blob just appears and wipes something else out. And uh, this was, it was watching this map play out where I really started to understand what I was trying to study with EVE Online, that I was really looking at, from the top down at this kind of like petri dish of uh, a, a human social ecology that was evolving over time. And it's very difficult to read this map, but once you understand what you're actually looking at, you can actually see these organizations uh, growing and becoming larger and more powerful o over time. So, having had that in mind, and thinking about the dissolution of Band of Brothers, I wanted you to watch another video. And this is a visualization of the entire internet as it existed in 1991. 
and we're watching the exact same thing taking place, where we are watching a frame, a snapshot of the structure of the internet as it grew day by day over time. And these, these flowers are network hubs. Like one of these is going to be Google and another one is going to be YouTube. And the, we can learn things about the structure of the internet by studying this map. The blue is uh, the United States. The red, I believe, is China. Green represents the networks of Iran and the Middle East. And I believe purple, if I'm not mistaken, is Europe. And so we can watch all of this happening as it unfolds over time. And this is a, a visualization project that's created by Barrett Leon at the Opti Project. And uh, it's honestly one of the most, uh, to me, one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen watching the profundity of this system start to develop. Like this is, to, to someone who studies the internet, this is like my pale blue dot. Like this, when I look at this, I see every hero and coward, every young couple falling in love in the DMs. This is everything. And so if you actually looked, and this is a very zoomed out map, we can't actually know what most of these hubs actually are. But what's fascinating to me is you can see similar things starting to take, starting to happen on this map as networks start eating each other and, and moving around and, and conglomerating with one another. And it's profoundly fascinating to me to know that if we had enough information, we could zoom in on this map, we could find EVE Online in this bouquet of flowers and perhaps even find the dissolution of Band of Brothers on this map in flow with the entire rest of the internet. And um, when I started thinking about all of these things and, and seeing these, eco these human social ecologies playing out in front of me, I started to feel a little bit crazy and was wondering, am I imagining all of this? Do I want this all to be very profound? Do I want Eve to be in flow with the whole rest of humanity and the internet? Um, or am I actually looking at something really fascinating here? And so in order to try to wrap my head around this, I reached out to somebody who some of you will know, others of you will not know, but I think everybody who loves Eve should know. It's a guy named Raf Koster. Raf Koster was the lead designer of Ultima Online. And I called in a few, uh, and Ultima Online was the direct design ancestor of Eve. Um, back, way back in the early 2000s, even the late 90s, one of the early mission statements for EVE Online as it was being developed was to create Ultima Online in space. So this is a person who knows a lot about how these sorts of systems actually work. And so I called in a few favors and managed to actually get him on the phone. And uh, I'm going to play a couple of clips for you from my conversation with him because it ended up being one of the most profound conversations I've ever had in my life as he immediately started to explain to me the structure of all human civilization across all eras of history. <laughs> and so I bring, I bring up this map for you, or this graph for you, because he's going to reference uh, what's called a Pareto distribution. And it's all very simple. He's going to He's going to fake like he's going to talk to you about math, but don't be afraid. He's not actually going to. We're going to move past it really quickly. But this is what he's going to be talking about when he talks about power laws and Pareto distributions. You can keep your eye on this map. You're, you're not too deep. If you take all of the cities in the world and you put them on a graph for population, so you end up with this. But if you take this and put it on a log scale, so this is the exact same data, but on a log scale. It looks like that. That's called a power law distribution, often called a Pareto distribution. Anyway, it turns out that magically throughout history, it hasn't mattered what the most powerful country in the world was. You know, regardless of what was going on in politics, if you graphed the population of the cities of the world, they always followed that curve. Think about how whack that is for a second. They always have this distribution to them. The biggest one is always n times larger than the next biggest and so on down the chain. 
I'm describing a shape of human civilization. All periods in history, regardless of geography, the largest cities in the world have always had this structure. If you take the wealth of individuals across the world, they have tended to follow this curve. I mean, these curves are hidden everywhere. They're hidden in things like your cell, like your body follows this kind of curve. The graph that is your body has only a very small percentage of cells that are actually in charge of shit, specifically your nervous system cells. And the kings of the nervous system cells are in your brain. You have cells in your fingernails. Not only do you not give a shit about them, you intentionally kill them off yourself because they're that unimportant to your network. So I actually kind of undersold the ambition of his comments because he went on to describe how these very same laws are bound up in almost every science, like the actual states of matter, plasma, gas, liquids, and solids are actually simply names for different levels of connectivity in the network graph between the molecules. So this is kind of like a... Uh, universal truth of how things actually uh, actually work scientifically. And he kind of blew, he started to really blow my mind when he explained how all of this applies to MMOs. The reason is because of how networks work. When two things form a relationship, any two things, <laughs> okay, any sort, form a relationship, mathematicians call that an edge. So think of it as a node and a line and another node, right? Let's say you've got a whole bunch of random nodes and you just roll dice to start attaching them. What you'll find is that they attach in kind of a soup. The, an average node has the same number of connections on average as every other node, right? But if you tilt the odds just a tiny bit so that a node that already has edges tends to get more. So I want to play WoW because it's where my friends are, okay, whatever. That's called a preferential attachment network. And uh, it's very hard to find things in human society that are not preferential attachment networks. You know, Facebook wins out over the other social networks because it's where everybody already is. If you take the populations of MMOs at any given moment since MMOs started, they also follow this curve. So he kind of blew my mind and uh, then further went on to explain that not only do MMOs collectively follow this structure, that not only are all of the MMOs essentially sharing a population amongst each other, a single population, a single community that exists and permeates all of the different titles that are out there, even included, uh, but that this actually also applies to player organizations. This applies to guilds and corporations as well. That this is um, essentially social science all the way down. And you can see this in the mega coalitions of NullSec, where you see these very, very few groups that conglomerate into massive coalitions of tens of thousands of players, whereas the majority of them fall into the category of these, uh, the long tail, the very smaller groups of 30, 40, 50 players. So as a storyteller of, of MMOs and as a historian of the internet, this is actually particularly fascinating to me because he went on to explain that there's this phrase in the science called a phase transition that applies to all of these different types of networks. And a phase transition is exactly what happened to Band of Brothers. It's when something happens that suddenly causes the network connections to shift. And when they shift, they tend to shift very rapidly. And you see that immediately there, something terrible happens to Band of Brothers and it turns to liquid in a moment, and then a moment later it's evaporated into gas and it's gone. And so, I started looking as a storyteller for these moments of phase transition because those are the moments of deepest humanity. Those are the moments that drill down deepest into these other digital social networks and can teach you the most by digging down into the history of why Band of Brothers was destroyed, what happened there, who was there, who did what, 
and why it all occurred, you can understand so much about EVE Online, and that essentially is the structure of the first Empires of EVE book. The dissolution of Band of Brothers is, provides the climax for the story. And so I went around looking for these other moments of phase transition inside the other popular networks within that shared community of other MMOs. And so the, the first story that I investigated was one of the more famous events in online gaming history, which is this, uh, an event in World of Warcraft called the Gates of An Kiraj. And the Gates of An Kiraj was a one-of-a-kind event in which every server of World of Warcraft received a new dungeon with the gates sealed, and each server had to go on a massive realm-wide quest that included every single player on that realm to work together in order to amass an enormous amount of supplies to, you know, uh, supply the siege on, on this hidden dungeon where the old god Cthune, this big eyeball, was waiting. Um, and they could only actually go into it when the entire server had amassed all of these, these this enormous amount of supplies, and when one particular hero from each particular server had gone on this months-long quest to reforge uh, the scepter of the shifting sands so that he could ring a gong outside the gates and open them up for the first time. And so what implicitly ended up happening is that this has created a race between all of the different realms to be the first one to open up the gates. And one server, one in particular, a server called Mediv. And uh, this guy named Kalahad was the very first person to open the gates in World of Warcraft history. And what nobody anticipated, including the designers of the encounter, was that when you have only one place on one server of, in World of Warcraft where something interesting is happening, every other server empties. All of the players from the other servers, not all of the players, but tens of thousands of players from the other servers, left their server, created level one characters on the Mediv server, and began a massive pilgrimage across the world of Azeroth to arrive in the desert in one of these higher level zones to be able to be there to witness the opening of the gates of Ankiraj. And that's what you see here in these uh, relatively exquisite screenshots of, of players massing around the gates as they were opened. So the second story that I dug into was this story that I call the Siege of Kager Mall by the Armies of the Dead. And it takes place in a zombie apocalypse text MMO called Urban Dead, um, which is a fabulous game despite the fact that it's a text-based MMO. And what ended up happening in Urban Dead is the, the way the game worked was the zombie side and the human side were not fixed teams. If you died as a human, you became a member of the zombie team. And if you were a zombie and a human jabbed you with a, with a medical syringe, you came back to life and became uh, a human again. So at a certain point, the humans got tired of running away from the zombies and decided to make a last stand at this place called Kager Mall. And Hundreds upon hundreds of humans showed up to defend them all, to try to actually create one little slice of civilization again in this apocalypse so that they didn't have to get dispersed by the overwhelming horde over and over and over again. And so what happens is the zombies all find out that this is where everybody is at, and every horde of zombies within the game converged on Kager Mall, and you have this incredible battle that takes place between thousands of players that unfolded over the course of more than a month. And the only reason why it ended is because Urban Dead was run by an independent game developer. There was only one developer in charge of the game, and he was not able to be inside the virtual environment and actually know what was happening. So in the middle of the siege of Kager Mall, the guy whose name, his name was Kevin, Kevin changed some of the rules. Remember that's that revivification syringe that I talked about? He changed the loot rate of those syringes so that three times as many syringes were able to be found, and the humans wiped out the zombie side by resurrecting almost all of them so that there were almost no zombies left in Urban Dead. And the story 
climaxes or culminates with um, a protest march that where the zombie side and the human side actually joined in common cause and became allies and marched across the city in solidarity to try to get Kevin's attention to say, Lord, the game is broken. We need your help. Please roll back. Please roll back the update. This is a game called Asheron's Call, which came out in 2000. And the graphics are great, aren't they, guys? Round of applause for Asheron's Call's graphics. Thank you. So Asheron's Call is a really cool game where they had an the developers of the game had an idea. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to uh, release these crystals all over the game world for the players to find. And what the players didn't know was that when they smashed these crystals and got a bunch of loot out of them, that these crystals in the lore were actually the horcruxes of the game's main villain, this winged demon named Balzaron. Um, and so the development team didn't tell the players that they were trying to trick them into releasing the demon through their own greed, right? They were trying to pull the old okie doke on them. And they were trying to like release these little hints that this was what was going to happen. And that's what you're looking at right now when you see these players standing on a mountaintop. The development team actually layered a silhouette of Balzaron into the skybox of the world so that when lightning struck, you would be able to see, just for like a fraction of a second, you would see the winged demon with his beady red eyes uh, beaming down on the world of uh, Dareth. It was called Dareth. And so once the players figured out that the dev team was trying to make them complicit in the destruction of the world that they were role-playing as saviors of, they refused to play along. They literally formed a secret society that formed oaths to guard the final crystal, the final horcrux of Balzaron the Hope Slayer, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for more than a month. And they, the cool thing about Asheron's Call is that every creature in the game had experience points and could level up. So if you were a monster, you could, uh, and you killed a player, you would get XP from that, and you might actually level up and become an even more powerful monster. Players used to troll the newbie zones by feeding themselves to like a level one bunny rabbit until it was a level 30 rabbit, and it was just rampaging through the, new, the newbie zones, nibbling <laughs> players to death, right? So they did the same thing to the crystal, and they turned it into a level 900 crystal that one shot everybody who ever came near it, and it became so broken that it started refusing dev commands. And the <laughs> <laughs> they eventually figured out exactly why it was refusing dev commands. It wasn't like a ghost or something like that. But uh, what, what actually happened is the crystal had so much extra experience that the moment they tried to set it, its HP to zero to destroy it, it would spend its XP on more levels again and, and instantly re, um, refill its own health. <laughs> But it took them a while to figure out why that was happening. They were, I talked to the devs about this. They were like, we were kind of scared. We were like, what's going on? So this is, this is actually, uh, so what they ended up doing is they, they found the greatest troll in Asheron's call and recruited them into uh, basically a role play event where they gave them um, like infinity buffs to go in and role play the destruction of, of the, the crystal defenders and destroy the crystal. And what's, it, it's too long of a story, but you have to read the story. It's a, it's a, it's a great tale. Um, and this is, this is Balzaron after he was ultimate released. This uh, down here, this person in the orange in the bottom left, that's Vidorian, uh, the greatest troll in the history of, of Asheron's call, uh, who ultimately destroyed the crystal released Balzaron the Hope Slayer and commenced uh, what they called the fourth sending of darkness. This guy's another great troll. Fancy the Famous Bard was a character in EverQuest who, EverQuest had a problem with um, what you might call shitlords. They couldn't control certain aspects of their community, and so they had to create all these rules to govern these people's behavior and make sure that they weren't harassing people out of the game. And the, the players, these players, hated that, and they were like, well, we need to be able to express ourselves to the maximum 
uh, of, of our capability or else we're not living our fullest life in the virtual environment. So the solution that they came up with was to create a no rule server. And the no rule server had one rule. It wasn't quite a no rule server. They had one rule, and it was that any player who was less than level, lower than level six was invulnerable, couldn't be attacked by other players. So this was a ruthless place that was run by the worst elements of the community, the, some, of the, some, of the most, some of the best PVPers in the game, um, but they were mean dudes. And so Fancy the Famous Bard was a level six player who skilled only one skill, and it was called Silo's Accelerando. Silo's Accelerando is a movement speed skill that buffs your movement speed so that you can run faster than everyone. What he did is he ran around the world attracting the aggro of all of these what are called sand giants, which are very large, formidable enemies. And you can see, and it's hard to see some of these graphics, but you can see the sand giants are chasing uh, fancy through the, down the river, across the desert here. Um, and he would take this enormous train of high-level enemies and run it right into the town centers and kill everybody. <laughs> and the fun thing about Fancy is that he was role-playing as a doer of good. He worshipped the god of light, this guy named Mithaniel Mar, who was a, uh, he's a god in the EverQuest universe, who's, who's literally, he's a paladin whose face is so beautiful that he hides it behind his hair because it would pain you to look upon him. And that was Fancy's god, and Fancy um, killed everyone. Fancy killed 350 people across a rampage of two days, and basically took over Sullen Zek at only level six. Uh, the the no rule server was called Sullen Zek, and he became the level six god of Sullen Zek. Here he is again with a with a whole train of, of sand giants chasing after him. There's there's Fancy close up, with his cool green vest running across the desert. I love this guy. The Sun King shines on the Devil of the Republic, the best chapter title I ever came up with, is about Second Life, one of the weirdest and ultimately kind of oddly coolest games that I've ever learned about. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was a really big fad around Second Life and the idea of creating permanent virtual outposts inside of Second Life. And the first political organization in history, I believe, to create a virtual headquarters was the, the, what's called the Front National in France, which is the uh, political party within France that tends to blame things on immigrants, which tends to be a thing that shows up at least once in every country, it seems like. But the denizens of Second Life hated this. They hated the idea that this was going to be an unwelcoming space, a, pl a place where they, they were celebrating the election of Jean-Marie Le Pen, who was the leader of the party, who is now, who is actually the father of the current leader of the party, Marine Le Pen. And so they staged a protest slash riot. They shot, they made guns that shot pigs. Uh, at the headquarters building, and they basically shut the entire thing down. They made lots of posters with Jean-Marie Le Pen with a little Hitler mustache on. And then my absolute favorite thing, one of, the, one of them made an AOE attack of Thomas the Train Engine, <laughs> which is just worth the whole story just on its own. Um, and so Jean-Marie Le Pen's nickname in France was the Devil of the Republic. And when the protesters actually defeated the Front National and forced them to retreat from Second Life, um, they, <laughs> Second Life is a highly moddable game, and they took a JPEG of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and they superimposed it on the sun so that forever afterward, Dr. King would be shining down, smiling upon the sight of a successful anti-fascist action. So, I've now been studying MMOs for 10 years, and I've been working on these particular stories uh, and studying, I've, I've written, I think, seven or eight chapters um, over the last five years in my spare time, chipping away at this and doing research on, on other games as well. But at the same time, I was writing about EVE. And the key takeaway is actually, it's profound, but ultimately very simple, is that 
We are from many games, but we exist across one larger community that's more important than any individual game, and that we are ultimately connected to our brethren across the gaming community, and to a lesser extent, we are in flow with the entire rest of the digital humanity across the internet in that uh, visualization that we watched earlier makes that relatively clear. And I find this so deeply interesting because these moments of phase transition, these moments where the social fabric of the world breaks down, has everything to teach a modern social media about what awaits all of us in a digital future. Because I've got bad news. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't know about any of this stuff. He's never studied it. Elon Musk doesn't know about the history and what the history of gaming and online gaming has to teach social media about the internet's past. And it's almost disappointingly, these moments of protest and rupture, are, these social failures where these societies kind of came apart, are, are far more complicated and interesting than what's going wrong with modern social media today, which is failing at elements that are far more basic than what games like EVE are experimenting with in the modern world. And so that is one of the great things about EVE and the responsibilities of EVE moving forward is that EVE is the test pilot for digital research, for testing out human social societies. Um, and it's, a, it's an awesome responsibility, and it's one to take extremely seriously, and I know that CCP does. So, I've loved writing these stories so much because they take place in deeply fantastical environments and star these bizarre characters, and they grapple with the functioning of, the uni of these digital universes and, and what goes wrong when things go wrong. And I've spent years trying to figure out what I should actually call this book uh, when so many of the characters that we're meeting and we're grappling with in this story are some of the most problematic elements of, uh, of, the universe, of these digital universes. Um, and that's why I came up with the name Edgelord Elegy, The Fates of Digital Societies. And I hope that you will consider, uh, as we move forward into the early next year, uh, becoming a supporter as we start to plan a Kickstarter. So all of my research over these past five years working on these stories suggests just one deeply and desperately important lesson for EVE and for the internet broadly and for social media. And it's that every time one of these societies broke down. If you study it closely enough, you find out that it was designed to break down exactly as it did. It was always going to happen. And so you have to study these spaces and understand the social dynamics well enough to get out in front of it and make sure that that collapse does not happen. Because in the future, where we're living in a world where Facebook has two billion citizens, the consequences of such a rupture aren't as cheeky as Fancy the Famous Bard. They're potentially extraordinarily serious. And one of the reasons why I love Eve so much is that I know that Eve does take that responsibility so seriously. And um, if Eve is going to achieve the dream of Eve forever, the only way that that is going to happen is by building the community person by person and making sure that absolutely nobody flies alone and that the community is healthy and strong. And I just want to say thank you guys so much for coming and for giving me an opportunity to be up here again. I've missed you all so much. Um, and how about a round of applause for everybody at home who didn't get to come this year. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.